Okay, I think it's about time to get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, <coughs> I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and you've arrived at one of the project briefings <coughs> that is part of the CNI um, Spring 2020 uh, virtual membership, members meeting. <coughs> and uh, we're about halfway through now. Um, uh, two month virtual meeting that will run till the end of May. Uh, there's still lots and lots to come. Um, today, we're going to have a breakout uh, session with uh, quite a number of speakers, um, reflecting on the effects and achievements of um, the <coughs> merger that took place um, fairly recently between Lyricis and DuraSpace. This was a highly strategic um, merger um, for all of us, I think, because many, many of our institutions and much of our work depends on various um, things that those two organizations do. Um, it also was, I think, an important um, milestone in helping to um, increase the uh, sustainability and robustness of um, a number of our critical infrastructure elements. So I'm really going to be intrigued to hear about this. Um, I will hand it over in a moment to um, David Wilcox, who will give an introductory presentation and will sort of orchestrate the uh, panel. When the panel is done, we will take questions at the end. Uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate the Q&A. There is a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, which brings up a box where you can enter uh, questions. And please feel free to put questions in there as they occur to you during the briefing. There's no reason not to queue up all the questions as they occur, um, but we will try and answer them all at the end of the presentation. So with that, um, I'll just say I'm delighted to have this panel and I welcome and thank all of the presenters in advance and I'll turn it over to David. Great, thanks very much Cliff and uh, thanks to CNI for uh, moving this uh, spring meeting to an online format. I know I've enjoyed being able to attend uh, more of the sessions through webinars and, uh, and even download the, the videos of the ones that I've missed. Uh, and so as Cliff mentioned, I'm going to be uh, primarily moderating this session. So uh, I'm going to provide a, a brief introduction here, uh, just setting a little bit of context, particularly for those of you that might be less familiar with DuraSpace or Lyricis or some of the programs uh, that we work with. Uh, and then the, the focus here really is going to be uh, on Q&A with the panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, and then we do plan to leave enough time at the end for, uh, for questions from the audience. So um, uh, do feel free to put those questions in uh, as, uh, as Cliff mentioned. So uh, the panelists here today are uh, Julia Trimmer from Duke University, Christy Park from Texas Digital Library, Robin Rugaber from the University of Virginia, Rosalind Metz from Emory University, and Tim Shearer from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and each of these uh, representatives work with one or more of the programs that we're gonna be talking about here today. So very briefly, DuraSpace was a nonprofit technology organization that existed between 2009 and 2019. And amongst other things, DuraSpace stewarded uh, three open source community supported programs uh, and those are DSpace, Fedora, and Vivo. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about each of those in a moment. But together, we supported a global community uh, of over 3,000 users of those programs. And so in 2019, uh, DuraSpace merged with Lyricis. Uh, and Cliff mentioned this, but the, the focus here really was on uh, being able to achieve greater impact and greater sustainability uh, for all of the programs that, uh, uh, that we work with. Uh, so more resources, more programs, but also more expertise uh, by combining the, uh, the staff of uh, both of those organizations to, uh, to work together. 
So I won't read all this, but this is just the mission statement from Lyricis. It's quite similar to the mission statement uh, that we had at, uh, at Duraspace. And so uh, the organizations were quite well aligned from the start here. But there's a great focus on, uh, amongst other things, uh, enduring access to our uh, collective heritage uh, through leadership in, in open technologies, which is um, some of the things that we're gonna be talking about here today. So very briefly, and, and this really is brief, uh, uh, this is not a product presentation. We're not gonna be talking about features or, or anything like that. Um, I have quite literally one sentence for each of the programs that we're gonna be discussing. Uh, and I should say too, this is not an existive, uh, an exhaustive list of programs uh, that, uh, uh, that Lyricist works with. These are just the ones that we could kind of fit into this panel to, uh, uh, to talk about here today. Um, and so one of them is Archive Space, which um, is an open source archives information management application uh, focused on managing and providing web access to archives, manuscripts, uh, and digital objects. Uh, DSpace is a turnkey digital repository application. Uh, it's open source, it's free, uh, created by and for libraries uh, all around the world. Fedora is uh, also an open source repository platform, uh, a little more focused on flexibility and modularity, uh, and, and also with an increasing focus on digital preservation. Vivo uh, is notably not a repository. Vivo is both open source software and an ontology for recording, editing, searching, browsing, and visualizing scholarly activity. And finally, Samvera, and, and I should note here that uh, Samvera has a somewhat different relationship with Lyricist than uh, the other programs. We may be able to speak to that uh, during the panel session here today. But Samvera is a community of information and technology professionals uh, who share challenges, build expertise, and create sustainable software solutions for digital collections. So I do have some links at the end of the presentation if you want to learn a little bit more about any of these programs. Uh, but we're going to move here now to the uh, to the Q&A portion. So we've prepared uh, a small set of questions that each of the panelists is, is going to respond to. Uh, and then we're going to follow this with uh, with audience Q&A. And, and, and I think to start us off here uh, for the uh, for the questions, I'll, I'll just call uh, on the panelists so that we're not sort of stepping on each other, um, trying to get to the microphone first. Uh, and I'll, I'll do this uh, if I can uh, uh, remember to in, in just sort of al alphabetical order by, by first name. So if you all can. Uh, remember where you fit in that sequence, that'll, uh, that'll help. And if I can remember. So um, first question, uh, what was the status of your program? Uh, and in this case, each of the panelists is gonna choose uh, primarily one program to talk about, although uh, for the future questions, uh, uh, we may talk about more than one uh, each, but uh, what was the status of your program and, and what were your exp expectations going into the merger? Uh, and were those expectations realized? Uh, so I, I think, Julia, that makes you first in alphabetical order if you want to uh, start us off. Sure. Thanks, David. And hi, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm the, the chair of the Vivo Leadership Group, and the leadership group is the kind of governance, the main governance board uh, for Vivo. Uh, so before the, the merger, the leadership group uh, put a list of questions about the merger together um, and shared them with lyricists, and I'm going to talk about three of them. Um, the first was uh, the leadership group said, Vivo seems to be a rather different kind of entity than other lyricist products. Vivo is not strictly a library service. Uh, so how does Vivo fit into the lyricist product strategy? You know, how do we move forward together? Um, and since then, I've really seen evidence that uh, Lyricis is uh, planning to expand in ways that will provide opportunities for Vivo. Um, for example, supporting research and research data. Um, Lyricis wants to move into more global markets as well. And Vivo currently has um, uh, active implementations in 19 countries. So I hope that we can help with our existing partnerships there. Um, the second question we had was, will the MOU between Duraspace and the Vivo project be honored through 2019? And it was. We will also renew our MOU for fiscal year 21. Um, third, um, does Lyricist understand what Vivo is and how will they support us? Uh, and, and since the merger, um, I will say that we've worked a lot with um, leadership in Lyricis. They certainly are familiar with um, Vivo's value proposition 
and they've already given us a lot of support. So um, I think over time, we hope to see Vivo more reflected in the mission and vision for, for Lyricis. Um, but overall, back when we were talking about the merger, the leadership group really felt strongly that Lyricis was a great opportunity for Vivo and that we definitely needed their expertise and help um, to grow. So thanks. Thanks, Julia. Uh, Christy, you're up next. Thanks, David. So I'm Christy Park. I'm the director of the Texas Digital Library and currently the chair of DSpace Leadership Group, which is one of the two main governance groups for the DSpace program. And I'll talk a little bit about the status of DSpace as a community coming into the merger uh, first off. So we had coming into the merger, we had pretty stable membership. We had some growth in membership. Um, between fiscal year 18 and the current fiscal year, we've added uh, more than 30 new members, uh, many of them coming from a, a large consortium in Germany that we've, we brought in. So we've had good stable membership income, but uh, a, num a number of resource constraints, which I think all of us have been dealing with, and we were certainly dealing with that at the time of the merger. We have one full, at the time of the merger, we had one full-time uh, staff member, Tim Donahue, was, who was our DSpace tech lead, who was really bearing uh, a lot of the load of uh, coordinating the development and the open source community generally. And we had only just been able to bring him on something approaching full-time to the DSpace uh, program. He had been working on other DuraSpace projects before that part-time. So uh, for the year or two prior to the merger, the DSpace community had really been looking for ways to raise income in, and funds so that we could hire additional FTE. So that was a, a real um, uh, issue for us and remained so at the point of the merger. The other um, Thing that we were really focused on at the time that the, the merger took place is DSpace 7 development. Uh, this has been going on for since around 2016. It's a major rewrite of the DSpace platform uh, to modernize it, bring it in line with uh, the core next generation repository principles, open air v4, um, GDPR compliance, really modernize it, make it a competitive repository platform with a new user interface. A very ambitious undertaking that we started with all volunteer coders as we have historically. And so that was putting a lot of pressure and a lot of uh, creating a lot of resource constraints for the community as well. And uh, at the time of the merger, we were really starting to think about how we needed to change the way or uh, adjust the way that we were approaching that development. And then finally, I'll say just about the status of the organization or the, the program is that um, like similar to Vivo, DSpace is a global, uh, has a global user base. There are 2,500 or more, 2,500 known installations of DSpace around the world and uh, a large global user base but a majority of those users are not contributing members to the open source program. And so one of our challenges at the time of the merger and that continues to be is finding ways to convert those users uh, into engaged members of the community. So those are some of the challenges that we came into this merger with. In terms of expectations, um, I, I'm going to speak mostly for myself in terms of uh, our expectations coming into the merger. And I'll say one of my expectations is that there would be some level of culture clash and adjustment as the merger um, took place. Um, that, and I've, I've been through, you know, corporate mergers and all, all kinds of things where that's just always the case, even under very good circumstances. And this, I think, is was a very good circumstance where uh, most, most of our community could see the benefits in terms of sustainability and scalability of this merger. Um, and yet we're wary of uh, how it would change DSpace, DSpace's culture, DSpace's community. 
And secondly, we, because we are a global uh, program, uh, we had a number of members of our governance groups uh, in Europe and Latin America who were not familiar with Lyricis. And so that adjustment of um, building trust between the DSpace community and, uh, and, and Lyricis took some time. I think another expectation we had is that, you know, the benefits of this merger would accrue to DSpace in some form or fashion, that additional resources, additional expertise, uh, would be available to us that we would be able to think about ways that we could ease the load on our single FTE. And uh, I think that for the most part, those expectations were realized. I won't go into detail now on that, though I may have some things to say about it later on. But I will say too that one of the ways that my expectations have been exceeded in this process is just the higher level of CEO level and executive level engagement and energy um, with DSpace that we have seen that has been really beneficial to the DSpace program as we've tried to raise funds and, uh, and make some changes to benefit the program. And I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Christy. Uh, I believe Robin is next. Yes, thanks, David. So archive space, I'll start out by saying that I was one of the people that was in the group who laid out the very first requirements that would become part of those requirements would feed into the creation of archive space. So while I haven't been in governance, I've been watching archive space and UVA adopted it as soon as it was ready to be released. <clears throat> archive space is a little different from the other programs that have been, that are represented on the panel primarily because it was a mature program already part of Lyr the Lyricist organization. Archive Space was primarily expecting, I think, to work more closely with like-minded community supported programs coming from DuraSpace. And I really think that the community saw an opportunity to share resources, explore integrations between programs and see what we could learn from one another. Um, as part of this panel, I'd interview Lori Arp, who is very deeply involved. UVA has a developer that works on the development team, and we've had people off and on contribute in different ways to archive space. But I think it's unique in that it was already part of Lyricis, and I think there was a real, um, I think, optimistic look at the possible merger and the opportunities that that would provide. Great, thanks Robin. Uh, mm -hmm. Rosalind, I think you're next. So my name is Rosalind, I'm at Emory University. I'm uh, actually the uh, chair elect for Sanvera, so I'm going to speak a little bit about Sanvera. Um, so as David alluded to during the intro section, Sanvera is different than it's different in many ways um, than uh, some of the programs that we're talking about here. Um, but in regard to its relationship with DuraSpace, it was different in that it was not underneath an umbrella, an underneath the larger umbrella organization of DuraSpace. Um, although I will say that um, Deborah Hankin Kurtz, who at the time was heading up DuraSpace, was on um, Sam Veras formerly Hydra, Sam Vera steering for um, a while. Um, and so we did have a really close relationship um, with DuraSpace. Um, so when the merger between Lyricis and DuraSpace was announced, um, I would say that the community was um, very hesitant about this um, relationship. Um, at the time, we were rethinking governance, um, in that Samvera sort of had no <laughs> uh, governance. I mean, it had governance, it had norms that it was following, but it didn't have um, really um, hard governance the way many of the DuraSpace projects did. Um, we were also considering hiring staff. Um, that was something that Samvera, even though it is over 10 years old, 
had resisted doing. Um, it was primarily run by its community members. There, were, there was no centralized staff sort of helping um, except for staff at Duraspace who would help with finances. Um, and um, as hiring staff, we were um, working toward developing a contribution model. And so Samvera for its first 10 plus years had really run on the idea that we were not going to ever ask you for money, that all we would ever ask you for was your time and your dedication to the project. But if we were to hire staff, it really necessitated the need for um, financial uh, resources coming into the community in a regular fashion. Um, so when the merger occurred, we were sort of going through an exercise to rethink all of this. Um, and that is um, no small undertaking anybody who has been part of a community can say. Um, I mentioned that Sanvera is different because it wasn't an umbrella uh, or underneath the umbrella of DuraSpace, but it's also different in that it is a community of communities. Um, so all of the other projects named here have a single uh, piece of software that they, they work with, um, that they're responsible for maintaining. And the Sanvera community has um, three, four, five, <laughs> always seems like there's another um, product that works with it. I would say the three most notable are um, Hyrax, which is sort of the flagship um, application, we'll call it. Um, there is Haiku, which is a hosting hosted um, hosting service um, for um, Hyrax and um, other or custom Sanvera software. Um, and then there's Avalon, which is for AV materials. Um, so those products are are underneath the Sanvera umbrella, but they are also their own communities in their own rights. So the needs of Avalon um, don't actually always mesh with the needs of Hyrax. They don't always mesh with the needs of Haiku. And so figuring out how to balance those needs is something that the steering group for Sanvera deals with all the time. Um, so we were cognizant that we are very different than some of the other application or other communities that are out there. Um, and we were hesitant because we weren't sure Lyricist truly understood that. Um, and so we found um, around our expectations being realized, I would say our expectations were probably low. Um, and I would say that Lyricist has surpassed those. <laughs> um, but it's been a huge learning curve, I would say, for lyricists. So as we're discussing um, hiring of a staff member right now, you know, there was, I think, an assumption that the staff member would do a lot of what many of the other community managers, similar to David, do for um, each of the existing projects. But really, Sam Vera's um, community manager would be handling um, finances and helping to put on conferences and in-person meetings. Um, we have one annual conference a year. We have a virtual conference every year. We have two in-person partner meetings a year. And that's a lot of administrative you know, coordination work. And then there's the work around trying to coordinate sprints um, that we would also be asking for this position to do. And that was some, that was, Kind of a learning curve for lyricists. I don't think that they realized um, how much work we do around face-to-face -face meetings um, and that, those types of relationships. Um, it's it's still happening. We're still on that learning curve with them. Um, where they've been, I would say, very gracious in giving us giving themselves time and giving us time to get to know one another. Um, but we're also cognizant that. Um, this relationship probably will um, need to change in the near future um, as Lyricist um, sort of brings in all of these other communities and tries to um, bring them closer together and make them work, work more closely 
um, Sanvera will have to come to a decision point of whether or not it will choose to become part of the Lyricist organization or um, choose to continue down its own path. So I guess I'll hand it over to Tim to talk about Fedora. Hi folks, it's great to be here. Um, Tim Shearer, I'm at the libraries at Carolina. Um, I'm also here as a member of Fedora Steering and Fedora Leaders, um, but uh, I should mention both Robin and Rosie are as well and are actually chairing, um, but I'm just going last, so I'm gonna clean up here. Um, as you probably know, Fedora has been around for quite a long time, has a significant footprint both in North America and internationally. Um, as often happens when leadership uh, transitions several times uh, over the governance of a project, I think in some ways we were in a, in a, in a, in a renaissance um, in that uh, a whole new group of folks were starting to look at it. So at the time we were re revisiting how, um, how the product is staffed within uh, then DuraSpace. So like which software developers worked and there was a effort to bring in cross training, which was lovely. Um, we were re revisiting the community, uh, trying to bring in more voices, uh, be more inclusive and get more representation and expand. Um, and we did that on all the different levels. So we were looking at membership, how do we bring in different sized organizations with different missions? We were looking at um, governance. How do we get more representation and voices on governance? Uh, we were looking at our international uh, folks and seeing if we could get more international representation in membership and governance. And we were trying to explicitly tie ourselves more strongly to other communities, specifically to Zambera, DSpace, and Islandora with governance. So all that was kind of in train uh, as the merger was coming along. Another thing on the technology side, and um, I mix metaphors and my colleagues are used to this, but I'll go ahead and do it anyhow. Um, Fedora 3 and earlier was kind of like gardening with soil. And at, at Fedora 4 was like gardening with hydroponics. You were still making vegetables, uh, but you were going it with a completely different infrastructure. And as it turned out, it was really hard if you're used to having a soil-based <laughs> agriculture to switch to a hydroponic agriculture. And so there was a huge jump folks were having to make uh, to get from three to four. And a lot of people were kind of afraid and wondering why they should do that. So another thing that I think was going on was a realization that um, we'd inadvertently, in, a, in an exciting and, and great way, kind of chose a whole, whole different way of doing business. And so in Fedora 5 and now 6, what we were looking to do is to knit those back together so we all, all gardeners could use Fedora. And I think that we're relatively successful in that. There was some mild reputational damage, I think, during that period, too, uh, that everyone was working on repairing. So to me, that's the context in which the merger began. I don't think I have much new to say about the merger or what, what we were expecting, but questions about the membership model, uh, the community or communities, the cultures within those, the autonomy of Fedora inside that, the autonomy of governance, uh, what kind of staffing models who wouldn't, wouldn't be able to work on the Fedora projects, and even down to the more um, um, banal alignment of schedules and meetings. We had our own cycles of schedules and meetings and Lyricist did. So all those things were popping up. Um, and so what we did know is that Fedora had a great community and great leadership uh, and a, a great staff. And so we were hopeful. And I think we found at least so far that um, some of those things that we could have worried about are really not to be worried about right now. So with that, I'll kick it back to David. Great, thanks, Tim. Uh... So uh, on the next question, uh, really just kind of wondering what impacts either positive or negative the merger has had on the programs that you work with. And, and so, you know, we don't have to necessarily have everyone speak about the exact same programs. I think it's just whatever is most relevant to you as we, as we go through. But Julia, if you'd like to, to start us off again, and we can just keep the same order. Uh, sure. Um, so we um, in Vivo uh, kind of took advantage of the merger to do a program assessment, and I think all of the other DuraSpace programs did as well. But it was really helpful for, for Vivo, and it enabled the leadership group to clarify the most important priorities that we had. Um, our project director, Mike Conlon, was ready for a transition. Um, Where's this and this uh, assessment process helped us through that. Uh, we began um, and, and completed um, an It Takes a Village assessment with Lori Arp and Megan Forbes um, that helped us take a fresh look at 
all aspects of the project um, and in terms of sustainability. Um, I think the leadership group really has a much better understanding of the project now. And, and I would say that everybody um, is more engaged or was more engaged before the pandemic hit. Um, and then I'll just add that I'm looking forward to seeing some kind of uh, coordinated communication strategies and, and updated branding for the Duraspace community supported programs, but, but I realize that takes time. Uh, so that's it for me. And I'll add from the DSpace perspective, I think the greatest positive impact for us has been, I, this not terribly surprising, but the greater um, size and breadth and scale of the organization under Lyricis has allowed us to take advantage of some additional resources within the organization, um, bringing in people from other parts of the organization to help us take a fresh look at some things. That has been really positive for us and has also let us take some risks um, with how we move forward with development, with uh, um, uh, other things that we're trying to do in ways that we couldn't with Duraspace because we had to be very conservative. There wasn't much of, as much of a safety net, I guess you'd say. And so, for instance, with DSpace, we have moved uh, to a paid development model for the remainder of DSpace 7, which adds expense. Um, and we're doing fundraising to cover those expenses right now, but because we have the, the um, larger organization with more resources kind of behind us, uh, we can take on that risk in a little bit with a little bit more confidence. Thanks, Christy. Uh, go ahead, Robin. Oh, you're muted. I think the largest impact that archive space experienced was having to move within the organization and move under new executive leadership. Um, when Duraspace merged with Lyricis, it became the division of community supported programs. And so collection space, archive space, and other things moved in under. But um, while it's only been a short time, and I think a lot of the expectations Archive Space had has not yet been realized. I think that they have um, actually been able to work more closely with the other programs. There's been a lot more sharing of things like lessons learned. Uh, I think the overall cost for all the programs for that executive level and has gone down, or at least they're getting more for their money, if that makes sense, because we've got a much fuller administration level, and as Christy was saying, a much uh, larger budget within Lyricist for all these programs. But, you know, the other programs coming in alongside Archive Space definitely had things that Archive Space could benefit from. Uh, I think it was mentioned before about the assessment being done across. Uh, and there's discussions across all of the programs and how we can share things. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to share things like development cycles and other things, but um, it's been largely a positive impact. Um, for Sinvera, I would say, um, this is very odd for me because I am, I will, <laughs> um, I'm also the chair for Fedora. Um, and it, it's an interesting dichotomy seeing sort of how Fedora has been impacted and how Sinvera has been impacted. Um, on, for Sinvera, I think actually we've seen some negative impacts, um, particularly around hiring. Um, there are um, MOU, um, which underneath Duraspace was easily sort of just renewed um, for finances. Um, we had to go through a whole new set of challenges um the one of our partner institutions emory university um, will be um hiring the community manager and unfortunately some of those delays around our mou caused delays in hiring and now emory is under a hiring freeze as everybody else is i'm sure um, and so you know we have i have 
as the hiring manager, concerns about whether or not we'll be able to sort of push this forward. Um, I suspect we will, but you know, you, you don't really know. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the COVID situation changes every single day. Um, and so I would say immediately it was that not really understanding why the community needed this position um, sort of caused uh, a lot of delays. Um, I think there was thoughts that, oh, well, lyricists can just sort of cover um, the, that work. And, it's, and it was like, no, we don't really think that they can, right? We think we really do need somebody. Um, and we need somebody dedicated to us because we are a community of communities and we're not just asking this person to manage a, a single community, but to help all of these products move themselves forward. Um, and so I would say on the San Vera side, it was negative. Um, on the Fedora side, it's, it's been positive. Um, we did have a lot of um, uh, integration with um, Aaron Tripp, who sat on in on all the Fedora meetings prior to the merger. Um, but afterwards, you know, having Robert um, sit in on our meetings, I think, has driven us in interesting directions. Um, like Tim mentioned, um, he's sort of throwing out ideas and um, asking us to think about why we've been doing what we've been doing and how maybe we can change, but I'll let him talk a little bit more. Thanks, Rosie. I'll go, I'll go quickly, but um, I think one of the things is that Aaron um, from the Duraspace side, at least that's who I'm aware of, probably some other Duraspace staff and folks at Lyricist kind of protected us from a lot of the legalese. <laughs> and so we would hear there's a decision point here, but uh, all this other stuff is masked as work. Um, so in some ways, I'm very grateful for that. Um, the, the main things that I kind of was looking towards after getting through some of the angst about change um, was the larger infrastructure. So when you're in a very, very small shop, you're building the website, you're writing the blog posts, you're asking for grants, you're doing the finance. And moving into Lyricist, there's more specialization and there's some real lovely things about that. Like, here's a thing we need to do and here's a team that knows how to do it. Um, and so I think that's been wholly positive. Um, and that's in areas around granting, infrastructure, communication, events, and finance, um, and probably HR as well. So that's really all I would say right now. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, and I think, and we've got one more question after this, but um, here we're just kind of wondering about unrealized opportunities, so things that haven't happened yet, but maybe things that you hope will happen. And, and I think just uh, for the sake of time, uh, if everyone has maybe one thing um, that they're kind of thinking of, uh, that, that would be probably uh, helpful. So we can start with Julia and, and feel free to, to pass and come back if you don't have something at, at, at top of mind, but, uh, but, but go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I think that I would say that, you know, we're looking for ways to um, make Vivo more accessible to a wider uh, group of, of wider community. So we're thinking about, um, ex we're exploring kind of possibly a more streamlined version of Vivo and a hosted service. So I think this being part of Lyricist and getting that guidance to, to find funding and even grants through the Catalyst Fund is, is probably um, our biggest opportunity. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I wrote one, one thing down as I was thinking about this, although I think there's a lot of potential um, opportunities, but the thing I think about is just, I, I would like to see more, and I think we can do more coordination and cooperation across the platforms and across the programs, which I think Robin alluded to earlier. Yes, I think I'd add to that. Um, besides the integration with some of the platforms, really, you know, some of the more mature programs, the older programs that came into Lyricist have worldwide adoption. And while Archive Space was built, you know, by people from Australia primarily, um, I don't think it's got quite the adoption worldwide that we'd like to see. So I think there's some things that could be some opportunities there. Um, so um, I'm gonna actually uh, sort of 
talk umbrella e unrealized operations you know christy sort of touched on better collaboration with um, all of the communities uh, unfortunately <laughs> um, the communities were supposed to come together at the core meeting in peru um, and aside from the fact that i just wanted to go to peru <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I was also really looking forward to that meeting. Um, I think there are things that at least the repository communities could benefit from um, around um, standardization of the tools that they have. Um, and, um, and that's not just underneath core, but from an infrastructure perspective, um, standardizing around the way that we do certain things that would make it easier for all um, organizations everywhere to move back and forth between different platforms. It would also make it easier for those non-repository communities to better understand how the repositories work and then integrate with them. Um, so I think uh, that um, is an unrealized opportunity. Um, I do know that Robert um, is very keen on making that happen and is really hopeful that we can come together and, um, and, and do that collaboration. Um, he was still trying to, I had conversations with him, he was still convinced after CORE was canceled, no, we could do it, we could do it, we could do it in Atlanta, Rosie, maybe you can host. And I was like, Robert, we're not having any meetings. It's, we'll have to wait, it'll be okay. Um, but I know he really, really wants to make that happen and bring all of these communities together. Um, I don't, I think everybody's covered um, the, the things that I would think about, which include globalization, a tighter knit community, um, and I think anything that reduces barriers to entry. So I think potentially hosting and some of the work that's been done to get us to Fedora 6 uh, and other, uh, some of the other products will help reduce barriers to entry. So greater, greater sense of risk reduction and preservation and access across all of our communities. Great, thanks Tim. Uh, so we have one more question, which is probably an obvious one, given the times we're living through. Um, but uh, after this, we are opening it up uh, to audience Q&A. Uh, so um, uh, do feel free to put your questions in if, if you haven't already. Um, and so uh, again, final question for the panelists here, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected uh, the, the programs that you work with? Uh, Julia, go ahead whenever you're ready. Well, I think the, I'll let others speak to the budgetary challenges. Um, I, I've seen that sort of the focus of uh, our community and our leadership group has really uh, been kind of fractured. People just are, are, don't have like, the bandwidth um, right now. Um, you know, it, it's really, it's such a sad time and, um, you know, that takes its toll. Um, but I, I also have been thinking about um, the challenge that, that this gives us, um, and that is really making open technologies and open communities um, a, a big part of our recovery going forward, right? How do we present and position um, our programs at, as the, the smartest way um, to move forward in these times and for so many reasons. And, and I don't know how to do that yet, but that's what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it's impacted us in a few few ways. Rosie already mentioned the, the cancellation of the core meeting where we were going to have these conversations about greater collaboration and integration. Um, our our leadership, our, our governance groups are international. We, we have members from Italy, Germany, and elsewhere where they were um, experiencing impacts much earlier than we were in the US and that disruption. So that disruption to our kind of governance um, dynamic has been going on for a while and that's, it's just difficult to see. It's emotionally difficult as Julia um, mentioned. And I think that it's had some impact on 
productivity in terms of the development, software development on DSpace 7, understandably and, and predictably. I think we're seeing that across most of our organizations. Um, but overall, I would say the resilience of our communities have been really strong. And uh, I think part of that is what Julia was saying about the opportunity we see to really lead in this moment with these platforms and the you know open infrastructure and open content and the the impact that we can have um, on what's happening now and what comes after. Um, the other I'll just mention. <laughs> I uh, don't really want to talk about budget stuff, but I guess that is one of the big impacts and we're in the middle of uh, a, a fairly sizable fundraising effort uh, with our members to fund uh, some additional DSpace 7 development and we were having great success with it uh, prior to everything changing and I think it remains to be seen what all the impacts are going to be on that, but that is, you know, something we're dealing with and concerned about. And I'd have to agree with others that have talked about um, the interruptions that we have gone through and whether that's at the governance level or at the development level, I think um, in one way, you know, everybody was working remotely anyway. And so sometimes our uh, conference calls and other things felt like business as usual and might be the only normal thing in our life. But um, but I think that our face-to-face -face meetings that we haven't been able to have, that's, you know, lessen the communication. Um, I am really grateful that we have the technology we have to be able to work and see each other online. Um, but there has been an interruption in the development across all the programs, I think. But also it's changed up how we have to argue for funding. Um, some people are saying that more digital resources are being depended upon and so that makes our programs more important. But when people are looking at the budget and our hospitals losing $80 million a week. So that's a huge, amount of money going out that has to be recovered. Um, so it impacts everything. Yeah, um, just to echo the budget situation, um, Sanvera sent out its first um, round of uh, invoices for the con for its new contribution model. And, um, you know, we've we've been clear with our community that they don't need to um, provide the full contribution until the not this fiscal year, next fiscal year. Um, but we're already hearing back around people saying, oh, I don't know if we can do that this year, um, which then brings issues to the next year. Um, so one thing is that's good is that we do have money that has been set aside. We wanted to make sure we had a two year cushion before we made a hire of a, a community manager so that we can guarantee the position at least always one year uh, in advance. Um, we didn't want to just spend down all the money and, and then be living hand, hand to mouth, um, so to speak. Um, I think everybody's hit the, the, the things that I'm thinking about. Um, it used to be like, who, who are you going to buy your socks from? And now it's like, well, maybe we're buying our socks from Walmart, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we're headed towards darning our own socks. And so the, the question then becomes, how do you, how do you fund this really important work um, with, with really limited resources? Um, I will say that the the thing that I think has been the most personally appealing to me is that there's a bigger seawall with Lyricist than there was, I think, with Duraspace. Mm -hmm. And so some amazing talent that I've worked with for years and come to care deeply about, I feel like are in a much better situation to weather this particular storm. So it's basically personal uh, feelings. <laughs> um, I will say that Este Pope at Amherst has, has written a lovely, um, description of how the, the importance of open, open source, open access, mm -hmm. open communities um, is at this time. And I just think it's kind of terrible that as the, the clarity around needing this infrastructure shoots up in this crisis, 
the ability to fund it, um, despite willingness, um, may, be, may be hampered a little bit. Yeah. And Gotham, I need to make one quick correction. It's 85 million per month, not week, for UVA medical, but it's still a huge loss. Um, one thing I also wanted to add on to Tim's comment is um, within Fedora, we're even talking about bridging memberships because we don't want to lose our community. Um, we have really great individuals who contribute um, from their institution. They give a lot back and to lose them would be huge for us. Um, so we don't want to lose those. And that's actually an idea that came from Robert. Um, he thought, he said in our um, meeting, what about bridging uh, memberships for those who may drop because of this crisis? Can we bridge those memberships just to say, yeah, you can't pay this year, but you're still a member. You're not, you're not going to get rid of us that quickly. <laughs> um, because those members, those, in, those institutions are really valuable, both from a providing financial resources, but also the, the human resources that they provide are extremely valuable. Yeah, thanks, Rosalind, and, and to everyone uh, for all the, uh, the answers. Um, I think we're, we're ready at this point uh, to use the time remaining for uh, questions from the audience. And, and I will maybe just leave this slide up as we as we take those questions, just uh, for any of you that want to learn a little bit more about any of these programs or Lyricist more generally, those are um, those are the links. But uh, um, yeah, with that, I think we can um, open up the floor for uh, for questions. Thanks, David. And thanks to all our panelists uh, for really interesting conversation today about these challenges all the issues that you're facing with this merger, this consolidation, and so many issues that I think apply more broadly at this time, which I think a lot of folks will find interesting in this context and in others. So I won't uh, delay any more because I see lots of questions coming in. So let me just get started right away. And the first question comes from Roger Schoenfeld, uh, who says, I'd love to hear more about institutional adoption of repositories since the merger. Specifically, are the various DuraSpace cloud-based repository offerings growing their market share versus BPress Digital Commons and other competing offerings? So th that's probably, uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, division of, of Lyricist that works on sort of the cloud-based offerings is uh, not the one that I work directly with. So I, I really don't have the uh, the numbers for that uh, that question uh, in front of me. I, I think it's a very good one and one that we could probably follow up with, but uh, I wouldn't want to uh, venture an answer just because it's it's uh, sort of outside um, where uh, where I work. And I'm not sure if any of you really have any insight um, into that, but I, I really don't have the numbers in front of me. I would say anecdotally, Samvera has seen uh, just a handful of institutions moving from BPress to Samvera. They're not, a, I mean, I would say that DSpace is much more analogous to BPress than Sanvera or Fedora are. Um, so I would sort of look to Christy to see, it seems like you're growing. <laughs> so I, yeah, and I think that the, the, it's a tough question to answer. We don't track this kind of adoption at the open source level as well as maybe we, we could or would be nice to. Um, it's very difficult to track who's using an open source product. Um, and so we have a sense of that, but not really hard data, as far as I know. Um, the DSpace Direct um, service at uh, Lyricis would be a good, you know, uh, kind of test for that. I, I will agree with Rosie. Anecdotally, in Texas, where I am, we see some, you know, a handful of um, institutions moving from from BPress to DSpace or other open source platforms, but we've also seen a couple go the other way. So I, it, it may be a wash. All right, anybody else on that one? Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks very much for that answer. Thanks for the question, Roger. Uh, looks like we had a comment come in as well. Um, 
let's see. Oh, it also includes a question. This is a very, this was a very helpful panel is the comment and thanks to all the contributors. Greater collaboration among the service offerings seems to all panelists to be an opportunity that the merger affords. Would any of the panelists care to be more specific about examples of collaboration that they see as most desirable? So um, I will say that um, in Fedora, we've chosen to move to the Oxford Common File Layout as our um, uh, way of storing content that we put into Fedora. Um, that has an upstream impact on Samvera repositories and Islandora repositories. So um, it may make it easier for folks to move back and forth between um, Samvera and Islandora or using Fedora to build your own repository on top. I would love to see <laughs> DSpace also uh, um, think about adopting OCFL um, again because it may really help um, with folks migrating back and forth um, between the different repository platforms. Um, so that is me lobbying, Christy, while simultaneously telling you what my hope is. <laughs> Lobby via presentation. <laughs> I also think that there's a real opportunity to share resources across the different programs. And Duraspace was doing that some. Um, but we've also, I think, done more of it since we've come under Lyricist. And that's in terms of, you know, if you need someone to do uh, some technical oversight work or uh, some project management support or bounce ideas, maybe you've got a new, a new person in a role and they need to have people to bounce ideas off of. There's a lot more cross-pollination across the programs that I think we could do. Um, I'll speak up and say, I, I think anything that reduces barriers towards um, any institutional entity trying to get their stuff into a system, manage it and preserve it is good. Um, I, I think some of the larger conversations were beginning to happen around the open communities. And what's exciting to me about this is to a certain extent, Lyricist synthesizes several voices into a bigger voice to help uh, speak to that need to coordinate more effectively nationally and internationally to spend our, our collective resources more wisely. But I'd love to see a small, medium and large or so, so that anybody can get their self, uh, their, their, their stuff taken care of. That's, I'm, I'm losing words. I would also say that the open, there's the open platform initiative. Um, one of the, many of the things that we talked about in that in, um, initiative was around funding many of the communities that are now underneath Lyricist. Um, so I do think that the merger between Lyricist and Duraspace makes it easier to see a way of being more sustainable with our open source communities. Um, again, you know, sharing resources, sharing technologies, making it easier to move back and forth between products. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of the challenges open source communities have been facing are something that Lyricist um, is well positioned to help us solve. I agree. And I, I want to add, I, I think there are some concrete things that we know about where we could collaborate across platforms like Rosie mentioned with OCFL. I think there are just some things we don't even know um, and we haven't yet figured it out. And I think that the, the desire and the idea of cross-platform integrations or collaborations has been around for a long time, way before the merger uh, with Lyricist. We've been talking about, you know, Fedora and DSpace integrations or various things along those lines. But I think that each of our, well, I'll, I'll just speak for DSpace at least. Uh, a lot of our programs have been very focused on kind of subsistence living, just kind of getting it getting it done, getting to the next year, doing the fundraising, doing the development. And what Lyricist offers us with its larger organization and, and greater set of resources, the ability to think a little bit bigger than that and um, to think beyond just the subsistence 
living that uh, some of us have, have been doing for a while. That's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you for the wonderful questions. Uh, I just want to invite you to go ahead and type in your questions. We do have a little bit of time to take more questions if you have more for our panel. And I also uh, just want to mention that if you would like to um, have your microphone turned on and um, interact, um, address the panel directly, make a comment, ask a question live, please feel free to raise your virtual hand and um, I can unmute you. And we can do that in this environment. Um, I also want to remind everyone that you are here uh, as part of CNI's Spring 2020 virtual conference. We are so delighted you made time out of your day to join us and hear about uh, this topic. I'm sharing with you now um, a direct link to the schedule for the rest of the meeting will be going on through the end of May with lots of interesting webinars and presentations yet to come. So check out the lineup and register for more offerings now through the end of May. So with that, I think we have no more questions in the Q&A list. And I want to extend a heartfelt thanks to our panelists for coming and talking to us about the merger, their experience, their reflections, and to our audience for coming and asking great questions and being a part of this webinar today. Bye.